what's good cannabis investors i hope you're all doing great and i want to welcome you back to my channel if you're new here my name is jordan and today we're coming at you with this week in cannabis news from september 30th to october 6th now before we jump in if you enjoy this video or you learn something please just leave a like on it as it helps out my channel and of course you can subscribe below if you don't want to miss any future videos now try to think of these videos as a time capsule Try to put all the news and facts in one place so you can watch episodes over time to learn about the evolution of the U.S. cannabis industry, identify top U.S. MSOs that you keep seeing pop up that you think will be worth more in the future than they are now based on their current market caps and new markets coming online, especially like Florida and Pennsylvania, and take advantage whenever you feel ready if you wish to do so. But we're happy to recap great progress out of Ohio so far as adult use cannabis sales exceed 76.2 million in under two months. If you supply it, the American people will vote with their dollars because they've wanted it for a very long time. Happy to report since launching August 6th for adult use, retailers in the state have sold 8,813 pounds of plant material and over 1.1 million units of manufactured products coming out of just 124 shops that can legally supply medicinal and adult use as of right now. And it's worth noting uh, a key driver of those are prime retail locations in major cities. And while these numbers certainly seem very low because I don't know the populations offhand, Columbus having 13, Cincy having 10, Dayton having 6, and Cleveland has, having 5 is certainly helping drive sales, um, but definitely doesn't seem like enough to properly supply the demand. All that to say is if they allowed more stores to open, giving more entrepreneurs equal access to opportunities to jump in the game, we'd probably see higher sales. All that to say, this comes from the Division of Cannabis Control board data. So all these links will be in the comments, but just pulled this up to highlight where they were at as of August 5th, the day before legalizing for adult use and launching. They did 1.9 billion cumulatively. So realizing, hey, the sky hasn't fallen. We might as well make this medicinal plant more accessible and easier for people to get. And just to highlight the sales growth now worth noting the medicinal column is just adding cumulatively to what they've done already and then of course non-medical adult use sales are tracked on this side so from the 6th to the 10th even people wanted to vote for legal cannabis with their dollars we saw 11.5 million right out the gate then august 17th the week after that up to 22.4 million a week after that up to 32.9 million and this is just normal when you launch for adult use because people wanted it all along to august 31st 44 million up to september 7th 54.6 million to september 14th 65.3 million to september 21st 76.2 million and then as of october 1st 87.1 million and so you love to see it and just wanted to share this clip from the dales report essentially highlighting ohio continues boom with 87 million in september and so at first when i saw these numbers i wasn't sure which one was accurate but certainly no complaints on my behalf and so if you want to tune into this full one i will admit i have not watched it but the link will be in the comments and they'll recap a bunch of stories few that we're going to get to uh, later on but moving through that just to highlight new mexico cannabis sales for the month of september we saw a total medical of 11.1 .1 million adult use sales of 35.7 million for combined 46.8 million and this is down from august but of course as we weren't expecting august to be a record-breaking month doing more than july it was and i mean things don't go up forever and so we've come back a little bit down uh, to 35 but no doubt i imagine december is going to be a record uh breaking month like it typically is every single year and so that is for new mexico while we got some fresh data out of headset.io looking at maryland cannabis sales 14 months after launching for adult use on july 1st of 2023 now as always take these with a grain of salt because i typically try to follow the state data though maryland has not updated september yet and so we'll see what the real numbers are however worth noting continued growth 4.3 percent year over year uh, for a total of 94.89 million for combined medical and adult use and of course that is down from a record setting august as well as to be expected but we're looking out for massive decembers going forward so you can pause to read if you're interested of course more information down here always more intriguing if you're invested in any mso's that have exposure in maryland um, but yeah wanted to share that wall out of uh headset same thing for missouri which launched adult use february of 2023 so a bit further along than maryland um, and also seeing very considerable gains 2.5 percent year-over-year growth for a cumulative 120.74 million so you'd love to see it you can pause to read for the details here um, again, I did not verify, I think, from Missouri either, so we're just trusting headset for now until we get the actual published data. So more information here if you are interested. Uh, all these links will be in the comments. Well, thank you, Dank Informer, for sharing this and going through that long New York report to essentially give us the good stuff. Highlighting New York's cannabis retail sales clocked at $63.5 million in mid-September, which should net out to $120 million plus for the month or over a 20% increase from 
record-setting August. So that's pretty darn impressive. Now, this is coming from a longer report that was published by Green Market, which we're going to get to a little bit later. So just wanted to share the sales since we're kind of on that topic. And of course, you can pause to take a look at that. Well, from New Cannabis Ventures, trying to provide as much of a summary of Western markets, the more mature ones that are struggling a bit more because they've got a lot of illicit cannabis to compete with versus the New Eastern ones coming online that we that has basically sustained the industry thus far. And then, of course, the two big players we're expecting, Florida and PA, to, uh, to go adult use at some point. But according to Alan Brockstein, and it is what it is because since August was a record-setting month, cannabis sales growth was slower in September. So reporting on Western markets... I'm not going to talk too much about this. Of course, you can just pause to read and see the breakdown. Certainly struggling more than Eastern markets. But when we scroll down, we see the potential, and especially for new markets coming online. And to me, it's just so impressive how Florida, still a medical-only market, manages to crush records month after month. And while Pennsylvania did have a record-setting August, didn't have such a hot showing in September. But the most important thing is to look at the annual growth, as clearly these markets seem sustainable as long as they can open more shops to properly supply the demand. But worth noting that this data comes from BDSA, so it's another private company similar to Headset. Uh, so take from that what you will, take it with a grain of salt, but also worth noting that the data doesn't capture the adult use market in New York yet, hence why you see a measly 12 million, which certainly looked inaccurate at first glance. And so take from that what you will, of course, all the links in the comments, but trying to paint as clear a picture of the state-led growth story that no one seems to really care about except us. And with that, uh, just highlighting what's to come out of Florida. Thank you, Toby Chanibus, for sharing this. I believe it's from AGP. Because Florida adult use is the largest a state catalyst for cannabis to date. And boy, do we need it now more than ever. And it's kind of wild, slightly scary, but ultimately exciting that we're going to know our destiny in about a month's time. And so Toby's just pointing out that, hey, all these MSOs, if the catalysts end up playing our way, are extremely cheap. And then post Schedule 3, once that predatory 280E tax is removed, he anticipates, again, these are his estimates, tier ones at 5 to 8x potential cash flow increase uh, without having to, of course, pay Uncle Sam way more than any other industry um, in the U.S. and the discrimination. But all that, what we're here for, AGP sharing. Adult use would reignite and accelerate sales and profit growth for multi-state operators. Yeah, no shit. And this is specifically looking at the OG Tier 1 MSOs, or in other words, the MSOs that have the healthiest balance sheets and likely the lowest risk versus reward. And that is Cresco Labs, Cureleaf, Green Thumb Industries, TrueLeaf, and Verano. Note that this is just Florida alone, and many of these MSOs have a much larger footprint than just Florida. And so looking at... Uh, Basically the same numbers in graph form from 2019 all the way out to what they're anticipating for 2026. While just sharing Florida legalization will make valuations increasingly attractive. If you don't know, now you know. And I don't believe that this accounts for um, removal of 280E as well. And so just think of once that's removed, what we can expect on top of this. And so moving along, nice to see the plant get some mainstream love. As CNBC highlights, Harris wants to stand out as the pro-cannabis candidate. Well, the easiest way is to actually fucking do something while you're in charge bitch. The industry isn't convinced yet though, no doubt, as Vice President Kamala Harris reaffirmed her support for legalizing cannabis on Monday. That was the first time she spoke on the issue publicly since she became the nominee, but industry insiders say they're hoping for more details and concrete changes. Yes, because all we've gotten is lip service for four years, and they haven't done shit. So we've all learned the definition of virtue signaling, and fake compassion, and bullshit, and you know, all that, and so just wanted to share this quote from Jason Wilde, the executive chairman of TerraSend. I'm encouraged by her words and her support for cannabis legalization. However, we need action, not just rhetoric. And we know politicians aren't very good at taking action, right? They're good at talking and yapping, but when it comes to actually getting shit done. So we hope this time around these campaign promises aren't just sound bites, but will lead to tangible change. Here's the thing. If we look at the track record, it's always been sound bites. So can we expect anything different? Probably not, hence why a lot of people are thinking Trump is probably going to be the best person to see any of this advance as quickly as possible, and I wouldn't doubt it either. But funny enough, another one from CNN, giving cannabis some love. What is happening? Is the tide finally turning? Cannabis may soon be rescheduled as a less dangerous drug, and here are five things you need to know according to CNN and Andrea Kanan. I just find this article so funny and ridiculous because they had a perfect opportunity to actually try and educate and inform the public on real benefits that we would see post-Schedule 3. For example, a big step in ending discrimination towards the cannabis industry that only the cannabis industry faces because no other industry in the U.S. 
pays the 280e predatory tax it effectively makes it so that they're working for uncle sam right now and not for their employees their shareholders and everyone within the company or for example making a game-changing medicine more readily available and accessible and we know the impact that it's having in fighting and combating the opiate epidemic where cannabis is legal we see a 20 percent reduction especially featured a lot of highlights of how that's actively happening right now in my last video or more importantly eliminating research barriers so we can actually find out most or all that we don't know about this plant, right? And so just a few examples of what they could have put in here. And while they recap a lot of the history and things that I've talked on for years on this channel, here, let's get into the five things you need to know according to them. Don't expect huge changes at the consumer level. Of course, they're going to start with a negative. Yeah, don't expect much change. We're not doing this for you. We're just trying to figure out how we can legalize it, give the people what they want while still keeping our money. Of course they would. Do your homework. Okay, like most people that are going to go to shops have smoked before. And I mean, you do your homework by testing, not necessarily researching. You have to test in order to learn. Trust but verify. What the fuck does that even mean? Are you reeling in the ears? Like, it's like a seven-year-old wrote this and they just asked him to say, hey, what are some fun things? And then know yourself. Of course, take into account your personal medical history. But it's like you had a perfect opportunity to really nail down some details that I try to feature in my videos, um, but ultimately comes down to some nonsense. Like, know yourself. <laughs> Are you reeling in the years? Like, yeah, okay. Either way, we love to see cannabis getting some love in the mainstream light. And so just to give you an example, what are the tax consequences of rescheduling cannabis? And I, I feel like this would be great news to deliver because people would be like, oh, I didn't know that. And I mean, of course, that's what we want, more people to be properly informed. But of course, that's not the, uh, the media's job necessarily. All that to bring you down to an example of the tax burden for hypothetical cannabis and non-cannabis businesses. If you're a non-cannabis business, any other industry versus what cannabis companies have to deal with now being in Schedule 1, you make the same amount of revenue, you have the same cost of goods sold, you make the same gross profit, you have the same business expenses, you have the same net income, you have a different federal corporate income tax, and then you are left with basically negative um, after tax income because they're effectively paying 116% tax rate versus every other industry in the U.S. This is blatant discrimination that, again, few industries, again, only the cannabis industry really faces. Um, and if they really wanted to take account to righting the past wrongs of the war on drugs, they would have done this decades ago, right? And so that is the reality. But hey, we are finally at the tipping point. It seems like we're on the cusp of change. Well, onto some studies from Mednext Journal of Medical and Health Sciences published September 17, 2024, Use of Cannabidiol in the Treatment of Compulsion Eating and Obesity, a systemic review basically looking at all the findings we've come across that have, again, proven prohibitionists wrong because cannabis doesn't just make you fat and lazy. It turns out it actually is more likely to keep you skinny. So you can pause to read the intro, objective, and methods and conclusion, but just going to highlight the results. In the context of anxiety and binge eating and consequent increase in the incidence of obese people, fortunately we can kind of do some more research now, the activation of CB1 receptors improves feeding, modulating the activity of of hypothalamic neurons and subsequently the release of orexigenic and anorexigenic neuropeptides. Thus, in obesity, the endocannabinoid system, which is inside every living mammal, and sadly most doctors and medical professionals don't seem to know that or care, they don't have to be trained on it, is generally down. So it seems like they're cannabinoid deprived. Wild. Regulated in central and peripheral tissues as indicated by high end or overexpression of the CB1 receptor. Therefore, CBD is beneficial for anxiety-related disorders. Thus, CBD has been shown to have anxiolytic or anxiety uh, benefits, antipsychotic, you can, that's self-explanatory, and neuroprotective properties. I think that one is as well. And so very fascinating findings, of course. Links are in the comments if you want to go through that. While from Siv X, I don't know how to I butcher that. All that to point out, exploring the interaction between cannabis, hearing, and music. Uh, this one's kind of like a no-brainer, duh, but it's cool that we actually have some data um, backing it up, looking at how cannabis has been long associated with enhanced music experience, yet the research is limited because of the Schedule One classification where cannabis never belonged in the first place. All that to point out, quantitative analysis revealed that participants reported significantly greater hearing sensitivity and levels of state absorption while high compared to sober. Imagine that. Cannabis might make you a better listener. <laughs> Higher trade absorption in music was associated with greater state absorption while high. 
qualitative thematic analysis identified four main themes. One, altered cognitive processes and reinterpretations. Two, auditory perceptual effects from new sensations to sensory overload. Three, emotional openness, sensitivity, and regulation. And four, embodiment, immersion, and out-of-body dissociation. And this study, which involved 104 participants, provides a framework to understand the complex interactions between cannabis hearing and musical experience. So all the links will be in the comments if you want to go through it. Of course, the more we can study, the more kind of mind-blowing facts uh, we end up finding about this plant. And it's just wild that we've been so limited, yet at the same time, the plant has never directly killed a human being. And so hopefully once we get into Schedule 3, that will advance a lot of larger sample size studies with actual humans. That's going to teach us a lot more that oh, would have been so nice if we learned this in the 80s and 90s uh, and didn't prevent the ability to do so. Well, from September 26, from JAMA Network, support for expanding access to cannabis among physicians and adults with chronic pain. This one's also just kind of funny as well. Of course, you can pause to read the introduction and methods and just going to want to bring you down to the discussion part, at least because it kind of summarizes everything. Well, the results here, all the different percentages based on those involved in the study, but this is the juice, and it's just so funny. It's like, yeah, obviously. Compared to physicians, uh, adults with chronic pain who've likely had to do their own research and have taken opioids or some sort of prescription pills and like, maybe I don't like the side effects. I want to try something else. So adults with chronic pain reported greater support for policies expanding access to cannabis, obviously, and less support for policies further regulating. <laughs> no shit. People who use cannabis for chronic pain were most in favor of expanding access, obviously, while physicians who had not and are likely incentivized to push pills and know nothing about cannabis and are not incentivized to learn about it had not recommended cannabis to people with chronic pain reported the least support. Obviously, right? Just show us the incentive. We'll easily show you the outcome. Most respondents supported training requirements for medical students and physicians uh, on the use of cannabis for chronic non-cancer pain, and that should be the case. That's the direction we want to have going forward, where we actually educate students and doctors on this wonderful plant. And limitations of the study include the possibility of sampling bias, yada, yada, yada. But it's just, of course, if you ask physicians that don't know anything about cannabis, they're not going to recommend it. But then if you ask people that have tried it or physicians that are aware of it, they will. It's just a matter of whether you know what's true or you, uh, you're pushing you're peddling for somebody else, essentially. And so, got this last one, more of a case study, but thank you, Mark Landers, for sharing this as meet 92-year-old Lucy, who credits cannabis for reversing her Alzheimer's symptoms. Now, if that's not something worth looking into, I don't know what is. And ultimately, at this point, if there's anything criminal associated with the plant, it's the government's lack of action and the fact that they didn't deschedule it decades ago when medicinal cannabis first came about because i mean just watch this some people are also turning to cannabis to treat dementia and alzheimer's but the drug is untested in fact the federal government calls it illegal but only on five some children and their aging parents tell betty you it's a game changer yeah so who's in the wrong here clearly the fucking outdated government okay a few times a day 92 year old lucy hansen takes a little capsule in it medical marijuana they call it my happy pill Everybody, and I call it my happy pill. Not too long ago, Lucy so was cute. confused, falling down, and speaking gibberish. Her daughter brought her to a neurologist. And they came back with a diagnosis of advanced dementia. We thought we'd only have her maybe for another six months. Enter Eloise Thiessen, a nurse practitioner specializing in cannabis medicine. Seniors are the fastest growing demographic of cannabis users. She weaned Lucy off of some medications and then put her on CBD. CBD is a non-intoxicating form of cannabis derived from hemp. I think Lucy's had one of the most dramatic responses with the use of cannabis. I've got my mom back. I'm Right? Like, man, it's one of those things. I wish I would have been able to introduce that to my grandmother and that Canada would have legalized sooner. Couldn't, but like, just, <laughs> how do you watch that and not think, well, we need to take action. We need Especially when we know that it not only helps people that are struggling with various ailments and diseases, but at the same time, it also reduces opioid overdoses by roughly 20, 25%. And so moving along to MSO news, Green Thumb Ministries to hold third quarter 2024 earnings conference call on November 7th, 2024. So less than a month away, we're going to see Q3, ladies and gentlemen. Get your popcorn ready. And so that is going to be after market closes Thursday, November 7th. So nice update from them. While apparently Green Thumb employees have buyer's remorse over becoming a union shop. And so I guess funny for them. They wanted to become a union. Now they are one. They don't want to become a union anymore. And so if they uh, win their decertification election, around 275 workers will no longer be covered by the UFCW. Now, I've never been in a union, so I don't necessarily know all the intricate details of how one of those works, but I'm pretty sure you just pay into it a little bit and they're supposed to look out for you. Uh, you know, kind of top level explanation. Now, what's funny though, is if we were to scroll down, I invite you to pause to read for the details. If you're interested, you can, of course, or if you're a Green Thumb investor. But 
what I thought the most interesting part down here. Anthem employees weren't the only ones having second thoughts about joining a labor union. As in July, Cresco employees voted to decertify its union in Illinois, and that's the second group of Cresco employees after the first group in Massachusetts in April. And so what is the reason? Um, Jonathan O'Connor, an automation technician that led the Cresco one, said it came down to economics, but get this, it more or less comes back to the treatment and the lie that they're told in the beginning, realizing in practice it's not the same, as there were multiple issues. People filed grievances, but we didn't hear from the union until we began the process to get rid of the union. <laughs> Imagine that. Now, I don't understand. Why don't these companies just provide an easy way for their employees to invest in stock or like show them how to buy it through their Roth IRA in the US? And then ultimately, once 280 is gone, who's going to benefit the most besides all us shareholders, the company, and the employees, right? I think that would be the best way to go about it. So if you know any employees, tell them to start watching my channel and then just show them how to open a Roth. But there wasn't much interaction. We never had a steward. People felt like they were paying them dues for nothing. And I mean, were they? Possibly. Clearly why they're trying to take action at this point, right? And so with that Verano to report third quarter 2024 financial results on November 7th as well. So on the 7th of November, we've got Green Thumb and we've got Verano. Verano will do it before market opens. So they will be first and then Green Thumb will be second in the evening of that night. So Look out for that. Very exciting and just over a month away. While Cureleaf continues Florida expansion with opening of Port St. Lucie dispensary. Um, so new location in Southeast Florida marks the company's 65th dispensary in the state and 151st nationwide. So again, planning ahead for a new world once Florida legalizes for adult use, hopefully in November on the ballot. Don't want to get too ahead of myself um, and expanding again across the country. So more information here if you wanted to pause to read, especially if you are an investor in Cureleaf. Well, there's a bit more here if you didn't want to grab the links. And while it's great to see earnings schedules released because we're looking forward to that or new shops opening, I think one MSO stood out this past week and I'm good to see them clapping back at the bullshit propagandists that are trying to push that hemp-derived synthetic gas station weed um, that's unfortunately a lot more of a wild card than what we know is the medicinal cannabis sold out of dispensaries that all the studies are based on. I wish them luck. Go Kim, as cannabis firm backing rec cannabis amendment sues the Republican Party and TV stations. And so while there was a lot of feedback on whether this is a good idea or not, especially because if the amendment does pass, it's the Republican legislature that would have to enact it. And certain people are making the argument that they're almost shooting themselves in the foot. I don't know. So let me know what you think in the comments, but just to highlight, essentially, as Florida's largest medical cannabis company filed a defamation lawsuit Wednesday accusing the state Republican Party of launching an intentionally deceptive campaign to mislead voters about a proposed constitutional amendment that would allow rec use of cannabis. And they have done that. So good on True Leave for not taking shit and taking action. With voting by mail already underway in the November 5th election, the lawsuit filed by True Leave Inc., which has spent nearly $93 million on the rec cannabis initiative of their free cash flow, and I mean, this is our version of lobbying, essentially, also accused the owners of two Fort Myers-based television stations of running a demonstrably false ad trying to fool Florida voters into voting against what will appear on the ballot as Amendment 3. And so what will happen? I don't know. The main argument against True Leave is that they're going to have a monopoly on the market, which is sure they have the biggest footprint, but it's not true because there's 25 licensed operators that can supply the demand. But it seems like they're trying to go after it and saying, hey, True Leave's making it so that if you vote for this amendment, you can't grow your own weed from home. And you want to cultivate your own cannabis. It's like, well, so many people don't cultivate their own cannabis. I don't. It's easier for me to go to the shop. But at the same time, we know the GOP is only saying this because essentially they want to support the hemp drive stuff that's funding them. Um, when we know that that's actually the dangerous cannabis, that if there was any unintended consequences, it comes from the hemp derived synthetic THC that's being sold through gas stations that you don't need ID to purchase and resell or anything. And let's just say Floridians did vote yes in November and it was deemed that it was going to pass and the GOP legislature had to do their work. Do you think they're going to go out of their way to include home cultivation in there? Absolutely not. They're just doing it because the hemp lobby paid them. And so we'll see what happens in the long run. Of course, full link in the comments if you want to go through this, but only time will tell. Well, last one from MSOs. TerraSend closes on remaining US $26 million draw of US $140 million debt financing. Proceeds from second draw used to pay down higher interest Michigan debt, essentially hopefully cleaning up their balance sheets um, and preparing them for uh, a brighter future as the loan carries an interest rate of 12.75%. Ouch! Very high still. Again, this is, again, what only the industry has to face. No one else faces discrimination like this, especially because it's stuck in the Schedule 1 and all that. And so what a day it will be once we finally land in Schedule 3. Um, but I think it was Green Thumb a few weeks back that got a loan at 5%, which is the lowest we've ever seen. So 
Sadly, still dealing with this bullshit, but uh, good on Terrasen for cleaning up that balance sheet. Well, on to other state news from Marijuana Moment. Apparently, top GOP Pennsylvania senator voices support for cannabis decriminalization. Activists who spoke with her says, and so take from that what you will. Um, Pennsylvania has been saying that they're going to write up some legislation to finally legalize for adult use. They've taken their sweet ass time, but now because Ohio has turned on the burners and so many people from Pennsylvania are going to Ohio and giving their tax dollars to Ohio to buy cannabis, it seems as if the, um, the Senate president pro tempore Kim Ward, whatever the fuck that means, has a positive sign that the dam on cannabis reform measures might be weakening in the Commonwealth. Yeah, I mean, we'll believe it when we see it. And so of course I will update you once we actually get some sort of bill, um, moving through their legislature while updated out of New York as Cannabis Report reveals the latest license numbers and sales stats, which are pretty abysmal when you know the whole story from 2021, waiting two and a half, three years to actually do anything, but that whole time paying lip service to all those you deemed harmed by the war on drugs without actually helping them open up shop and if anything, trying to pocket some of that money in their own coffers. But all that to say, you can pause to read the numbers here though the report is included at the bottom, and I'll try and put a link in the comments. I don't know if I can. Otherwise, just grab this, and you can go through the report yourself. Um, but yeah, pause to read if you're interested. More or less, just going to scroll down to the juice of it, because if you look at percentages and numbers-wise, based on licenses handed out versus shops actually opened up, not very good. And of course, you can say, well, what about the people that have to open up the shops? It's not all just on the OCM. It's on them as well. Fair enough. But Office of Cannabis Management seems to think that this is a good thing. I mean, if you're going to hand out 1,342 licenses and then only have 362 provisionally approved at this point, that's not a very good percentage. Um, and ultimately, it could either be on the entrepreneurs who are not holding up their end of the deal and you know they're too slow to get everything that they need done and that's why they're not opening up, or their system at deciding on who actually gets a license and whatnot is also pretty fucking terrible. All that to say is, as of September 15th, if there's 24 medicinal dispensaries and then 10 med and adult use dispensaries, and this is the run rate they're at. I mean, that's pretty good, hence, it's great we're seeing this boom, but this was the status quo for two fucking years, and they allowed the illicit shops to open up and run rampant. And of course, in the report, there's probably some mention, but there's still about 2,000 of those illicit shops they need to close. All that to say, this is fucking New York. They should almost be in the billions already, right? Just the potential could be so much bigger. Good news is we're going to get there. Um, just it's, it's infuriating when we have these Marxists kind of celebrating these pathetic numbers, unfortunately. And so uh, they're in a league of their own. Stupidity. Well, on to New Jersey. Thank you, Christopher Norman, our favorite source. Editor. New Jersey dispensary count now at 173 after Q3, 150 after Q2, and 117 after Q1. So slowly but surely providing more equal access to opportunity, getting more shops opened, helping drive more sales, and provide more access to a safer, non-addictive medicinal alternative. And so it's interesting to see if MSOs see meaningful sales bump in Q4 after New Jersey's legislative THC hemp retail ban starts on October 12th. And again, we love seeing New Jersey taking a stand against those hemp-derived products that are not safe as the medicinal products that we get out of adult use dispensaries. And so THC hemp products are already more available in New Jersey. Smoke shops and liquor stores carry them. But as of October 12th, that ban's in place. There's going to be consequences to carrying them. So we will see what happens there. I will update you along the way. Well, just to share, Florida Alliance for Retired Americans endorses Amendment 3 because no doubt cannabis is a medicine, especially possibly the best medicine for older people that don't like the side effects or consequences of certain uh, prescription medications that they're taking. And so, of course, either you can try and balance that out with cannabis or possibly substitute it for cannabis. But a recent study found that 21% of respondents over the age of 50 said they consume cannabis with over 60% of consumers acknowledging it's used to relax, help with sleep, or relieve pain. Many benefits. You just got to ask people and then take them at their word and trust them, right? And so with that, a bit of global news before we end off. MJ Biz Daily is 14 licenses for cannabis social clubs granted in four German federal states. Finally! The number of applications and license granted for cannabis cultivation social clubs in Germany continued to grow through September, but growth has slowed month over month because of bullshit bureaucracy. According to the latest data, 14 licenses have been granted. The total number of confirmed cannabis social clubs applications has grown by 34% from 226 in August to 303 through the full or the last full week of September. And now, like, why wouldn't you just allow opening this many? Because there's certainly that many bars in Germany. I've been to Berlin. I mean, if you have those outlets for drinking, you might as well have the outlets for cannabis because that's the safe way to do it. 
And that number is down from the 230% increase seen between July and August, where the number of applications grew from 67 to 226. Just seems like 14 is abysmal. And the discrimination. Treat cannabis consumption like alcohol consumption or better because it actually is. And then lastly, out of the UK, as cannabis legalization could be worth 9.5 billion pounds per year to the UK, according to an updated plan by CLEAR, the longest established cannabis reform group in the UK, which has highlighted the potential tax revenues that could be generated by a regulated market. So go clear, keep it up. Main thing to highlight, they estimate it could net the UK treasury between 3.3 billion pounds and 9.5 billion per annum, uh, according to the plan established by clear. Now, when I went to get the report, I basically have to upload, upload my email and all that, which I didn't feel like doing, but I might do it and just add the link below uh, once I publish the video for you all. But if you are interested, uh, a bit more information down here, obviously it speaks for itself why you want to end prohibition and create a legal market instead of having a black market one. No shit. Uh, not that I need to explain that to you, but uh, as always, links will be in the comments if you want to go through that. And well, last but not least, we've got this cannabis roundtable that was held this past week on key catalysts and fundamentals featuring Hirsch Jane, who is this fella here, a law professor and someone that's been around in the industry since states started legalizing, so he's very knowledgeable provide some very timely info while Anthony Varel from the Dales Report mostly talking catalyst rescheduling and Florida legalization. I listened to the first half, I believe. Uh, they do bring up a lot of key points. Like, for example, the it's going to be hard to challenge if the Floridians vote for Amendment 3 because the Supreme Court already approved it um, in April of the Florida Supreme Court, right? So a lot of these little things that we've almost forgotten about that has happened that should lead us to be optimistic that things will go the way of the people. Um, of course, True Leaf's campaign is likely going to help as as awareness is probably the most important thing and you need money in order to push things through the media waves. Um, but definitely worth tuning in if you're interested um, and especially if you've been invested because lots of good things to come. Still a matter of when, not if, and ultimately out of our control. So just plan accordingly for your own situation. All these links will be in the comments. But that is it for today's episode, folks. I want to thank you so much for tuning in. Really hope you got some value out of it. What did you think of the stories mentioned? Let me know in the comments if you have any questions or suggestions, and I'd be happy to address them. But besides that, if you enjoyed this video and you learned something, please just leave a like on it. Subscribe below if you don't want to miss any future videos, and I'll catch you next week for this week in cannabis news. Have a great weekend, everybody. Take care.